approach to public art is very design centric. It involves a lot of research, community engagement, and each project yields very unique results. Um, so I'm going to go through just a handful of my projects to have a good understanding of the, uh, how this design centric approach uh, uh, yields different experiences. So this is Up River Down River in downtown Louisville on the waterfront. Here I was interested in um, an homage to early travelers on the Ohio River. This project, Manifest you know, Destiny, I'm is... I'm having a hard time understanding you, because you're talking into the wall. Could you just talk out to me? Yeah. I might need to look back just to see what slide okay. I'm on. It's, it's, really so. it's really this room. It's that the sound of the room is so quick. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll even come down here. No, no, no. Titled Curiouser. 
Uh, and the idea is, missing some slides. Um, the idea is, I wanted the, the experience of finding a book and reading a book is an experience of discovery. Uh, this idea that you can open a book and each book that you jump into is a whole different world, a whole different set of parameters, rules, and laws. And, and, and I like that. And, and I wanted that experience to, to translate to people visiting the library. So if someone enters the library, they come across a weird kind of collection of objects as they move throughout and explore the space. So they might typically go to one section all the time, but they, they understand that there's a collection of objects around, and it would kind of lure them through the space inside and out. So thinking about uh, uh, the Reagan, the meaning of relativity, the tempest, uh, life in the woods, thinking about the different uh, literary objects with, within these book, within each of these books, and trying to figure out if there's kind of a universality to some of these objects. Uh, so after I started going through some important pieces of literature, I started pulling out uh, objects within them to see if there's a kind of crossover between these objects. So here's a handful of ones that we started with, and then it. Uh, this, I'm sorry, this. I just want to quickly see the arrangement is slightly different than I was expecting. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of jump forward and talk about how it was narrowed down. So start with that long list, and then move into a collection of objects that I thought uh, this 12 thought that had a good um, uh, kind of a, a wide variety of collection that talked about a lot of different types of literature. Uh, specifically things like Apple. Apple's really interesting historically in terms of literature because it, ex it extends all the way back to the Bible. Um, you can see it a lot in Norse mythology when they're eating golden apples to live forever um, and all the way up to uh, Snow White when she's eating apple falling asleep and then you know, things are happening. Uh, but, but thinking about these types of objects that really um, kind of cross over a lot of pieces of literature and something that would be interesting to discover throughout the library. So let me skip back. Uh, and so the idea is that we'll have a collection of these objects that would range from maybe six inches to three feet spread throughout the library, inside and out. Um, so here's a, a, here's a cat and a key. A key is one of the oldest symbols. Um, and it talks about unlocking things. And so I, I'd like to, as it related to opening a book, about unlocking these types of worlds. Uh, and so we're, we would imagine um, maybe seven to 12 objects, again, ranging in size. Uh, and and it being a curious collection of objects. So they don't necessarily have any rhyme or reason next to each other, um, but they would just be something fun to explore as you move throughout the library. So think about them again on the interior and on the exterior. Uh, so there's a couple main hubs in the library. So there's the community plaza, the uh, main reading room, the program room, children room, team room, uh, and the information area. So I want to get at least one object within each of these spaces. And for a place like the adult room where I was thinking maybe a, maybe a, a, a kind of a, a, a candle holder with a, a melted candle, something that's smaller, we could cast more objects and have them kind of nestled within the books or on top of shelves, uh, as opposed to the larger key, which might just be something larger in, in the information area, kind of casually leaning up against a wall. Yeah. Uh, so that is the general approach. Uh, in terms of materials, I would like to do cast bronze, just because it's something that would wear really nicely. I think it would complement the architecture nicely in terms of this kind of shimmering surface against more of this matte surface in the background. So it would be kind of a, a, a little specks of gold throughout the space. Uh, I'm thinking two objects on the exterior, and then the remaining maybe five to seven objects on the interior. Again, trying to create uh, almost like breadcrumbs to, to get people to move throughout the space. Uh, so I think that is. That's, that's it. Open up for questions. We're going to move to a slide like this. Just curiosity, can you just show the slide with all the objects or whatever? The text one? No, the, no, the, the, the depiction of one. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, just to answer that, just curiosity. Sure. The one on the lower left? Yes. A tooth.
Um, <laughs> it didn't make it to my, I, I started a separate list, just like, I wanted to keep it open, but I've been starting my list on the side, and Tooth didn't make the cut. Um, but based on that conversation with Charleston, I, you know, I might reconsider, unless there's like, well, teeth or <laughs> So just a question about the, um, the 
references because you're this so the question about the two plagues and the skull, really the references come from texts that you, that are in books. Right? So that's what is the sort, that's how you're they're all kind of bundled together for that topic, right? Um, which I think sounds great. Um, I, I really like the piece by the way. Um, pieces. So I was wondering, so two questions about then just kind of pragmatic. So the number of pieces, does it have to do with your budget? Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. And then um, I, I was wondering about the scale. <coughs> so there is that from 6 to 24, 36. So is the idea that they're kind of not their real scale, they're strange scale, so that they are kind of loom larger than life or smaller? Is that So a cat wouldn't be a cat size, it would be big. Or yeah, but cats, are, cats are tricky one. So, because I feel like a oversized cat would be just scary, because um, then you start getting the panther region. So I think cat would be one of the ones that would probably be accurately sized. Where I think key is an easy one to have oversized because it just it would just be funny as a three foot key. It just I, I just start feeling like those books are like someone's taking this key and like running off to a secret room and trying to like some Harry Potter kind of thing. Uh, so I think that so I think it depends on the object. But y yes, like I think. An acorn could easily be oversized. I think a teddy bear could pretty much be any size and work kind of like in the children's area. Um, the mushrooms, I think that they could easily be very small in the, underneath the underneath the bench or something. So I think it really depends on the. Uh, it certainly depends on the object and it depends on the, the location in which it will be installed, depending on what that scale is. But I think some of them will be scaled accurately and some of them will be more whimsical in their location and size. And I like the way you're installing them. Just. Found. Yeah, I want them to not feel too installed. I want them to feel kind of like, like people are just coming across them. What is the, um, the second row? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, that's what I would, in that one I, I kind of put out as a question mark because uh, I don't know how successfully it would work in a space. It is, it's a doorknob. So I'm thinking like this ornate, uh, some sort of ornate access point. And that was part of it was kind of like, does it does it work with the key? Like, if you have a key, do you need uh, a, a door to access? But I don't think that's actually necessary. And that the door handle didn't make it into into my next time. Thank you.
Life Foundation as the lead sponsor of the project. We should start with uh, Kate Monaghan and Susan Baggs at Flyer Baker Bell for managing the artist com competition, and Chris Nolan uh, of Central Park Conservancy and at Jonathan Kuhn at Parks Park Activities. As I mentioned, Fire Blend Bell organized the artist competition, which was based on the City Percent for Art process. Um, Pam Goline, Amy Freitag, the director of the J.M. Kaplan Fund, and Kanisha Holman Conwall, sorry, the deputy director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and Art, and art historian Harriet C. joined our Parks Commissioner Mitchell Silver on the artist jury. Amy and Harriet both recently served on the Mayor's Advisory Commission on Art, Monuments, and Markers. Harriet and Inshasha have provided statements that will be read shortly. I'd like to welcome Penelope Cox, who from the very beginning of this process has been the project's biggest supporter of our present. My name is Gail A. Brewer and I am the Manhattan Borough President. Thank you to the Public Design Commission for holding this hearing. I fully support the Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony Statue Fund's effort to place the first ever statue on a real women in Central Park. And I couldn't be happier that this statue will honor Stanton, Anthony, and the many, many others who work to make women's suffrage a reality in this state and in this country. There are dozens of monuments in Central Park, from Alexander Hamilton to William Shakespeare. But women, real women who lived and changed the world, have been entirely missing. For years, many of us knew this and wished to do something about it, but it took more years to build momentum. I'd like to recognize the work of Pammy Lamb and Colleen Jenkins, leaders of the Statue Fund, among many others who did so much of the hard work building that momentum. I'm proud to have supported them from the very early stages, supporting their early proposals, the Statue Fund nonprofit, and their efforts to gain buy-in from other officials and stakeholders. But Pam and Colleen have really led this effort and built the enormous coalition that's behind it today. Central Park receives more than 42 million visitors per year, and this statue will stand at an iconic, high-visibility location along the northern end of Poets Walk. I supported the jury competition and was pleased to participate in the process because it's crucial that the design be worthy of the location. For my part, I'm satisfied that it is. Meredith Bergman's design is beautiful, but more than that, the design finds large and small ways to reference the hard work of organizing. The interplay between these two women, both of them New Yorkers, and the roles they took on in the suffrage movement, and their personal stories. And beyond its depiction of these two leaders, the monument also celebrates the larger movement they were a part of and its many leaders, incorporating the important words of suffragists including Sojourner Truth, Lucy Stone, Alice Paul, Lucy Barnes, Mary Church Terrell, Carrie Chapman Catt, Anna Howard Shaw, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, Ida B. Wells Barnett, Lucretia Mott, Anna Julia Cooper, Ernestine Rose, Alba Belmont, Frances Willard, Adelina Otero Ward, Rose Schneiderman, Mary Burnett Talbot, and Inez Mulholland. The design is worthy of Central Park, the history it is depicting, and the history it is making for itself. The design has also improved throughout the process, benefiting from feedback. The changes that we have seen in recent weeks, such as those to the pedestal design, the monument's orientation, and the readability of the inscription of the petition scroll are all meaningful enhancements. Finally, I believe this monument the message behind it and the message we send by erecting it are all urgently needed now. The struggle of women's suffrage movement and the role that these women and so many others played in it have heightened importance against the backdrop of our national reckoning on sexual harassment and our continuing struggles for equal pay and equal rights at work, reproductive freedom and autonomy, and an end to structural sexism and misogyny.
startling moment of recognition about the importance of commemorating actual women in our public spaces a number of years ago when I was teaching an undergraduate class in the history of public art. I asked the students to name a woman we should honor with a memorial. The result was absolute silence. And that was echoed more than once in graduate seminars and even among friends. Without models, people were unable, at least initially, to come up with any names at all. Happily, that is about to change. This commission honors not just one woman, but two, and an entire movement. The call for proposals specified that the memorial reference others who helped make women's suffrage possible. Most existing memorials, as I'm sure you have noticed, are dedicated to a single individual, usually a man, not an entire movement. And those that are, like Maya Lin's Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, consist only of text. Here, Meredith Bergman has not only created two compelling portrait figures, she has done so in a way that reveals their close relationship and their individual roles. Susan B. Anthony is standing, as she was in her public function, as the voice of the movement, her well-known satchel at her feet. Elizabeth Cady Stanton is seated, producing the words that encapsulate, uh, encapsulated its message. Already in 1848, she stated, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. The scroll emerging from her writing table contains quotes that reveal the power and the passion of many of the pioneers who fought for women's right to vote. These will be readable by the viewers. Most importantly, perhaps, it contains the 19th Amendment. All these words by all those women culminate in a ballot box, reminding us that we have the right to vote and inviting, indeed, urging us to do so. Even if someone did not totally, even if someone did not know who these women were, the memorial illustrates their mission so clearly that a totally uninformed viewer will get it and will understand viscerally as well as intellectually that history takes time and many voices. Meredith Bergman has accomplished something that seems to me unique. She has seem seamlessly expanded the definition of a monument to consist of recognizable portraits, significant and legible texts, and an invitation to viewers to participate in the essence of democracy, the right to vote. This compilation of elements and the expansive narrative it conveys suggests to me, at the very least, a new model for memorials and perhaps even a new paradigm.
It skillfully portrays both the magisterial leader Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, while acknowledging their fellow activists such as Sojourner Truth, Alice Paul, Harriet Tubman, and other stalwarts that made this movement of global import. In its eloquence, elegance, and presence, this sculpture will stand at a testament and a commemoration for generations yet unborn. Lucy Stone, uh, the Morning Star Women's Rights Movement, 
Abigail Adams and Phyllis Wheatley, and they're three different ages. Phyllis Wheatley died young, so she gets to be young and beautiful. Abigail Adams is kind of the grandmother of our country, so she's the eldest. And Lucy Stone uh, moved to Massachusetts in middle age and started her wire service and her workplace journal and that kind of uh, activism. The theme was that they all had an impact on society through their writing. Phyllis Wheatley, through her poetry, including a poem she wrote, in honor of George Washington, who was invited to visit him in his camp, which was kind of an amazing demonstration of all people being created equal. Um, and the Adams, looking back through time, and the quotations on their pedestals refer to both the fact that they are statues looking back through time and what they experienced, and to her attempts to get her husband to remember the ladies and incorporate that into the law. Lucy Stone just kind of flung her pedestal down. She was the most active. She was the, the fighter. Uh, this is an eight-foot bronze, um, so within scale to what I'll be doing in the park. Marion Anderson, this was chosen by the music department of a woman's college in South Carolina. They were putting up a series of statues of great American women by American sculptors. Um, I love this project. In New York City, in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. This is larger than life. It's about 1.5 times their size. Someone had given the cathedral pieces of the Noah, which had just been in their basement or their courtyard for 10 years. And I made a pedestal that remembers the architecture of the towers. And you see, it's, it functions as a relic. You see these pieces of rubble, a piece of fabric, not stained. They were from the concourse, but they're still very, very powerful and kind of visceral. Um, this figure I <coughs> dreamed up right after the attacks and made it the scale just for myself. Um, uh, Brooklyn Historical Society, I was an artist in residence, uh, told a work from their collection, including their building, which I have loved since 1975 when I moved to Brooklyn Heights. And it has giant heroic heads 40 feet up of Michelangelo, Shakespeare, Gutenberg, and Beethoven surrounded by American plants. So I found the bill of sale for selling Maria Diggs, Pinky was her nickname. She was 116th African American, and she was the first of a series of very pale skinned, uh, heart rending little girls that Henry Ward Beecher brought out in front of his congregation and auctioned. He impersonated the slave auction to get his congregation to pay for their freedom and their education. And she was such a great success that he did this many more times. Um, <coughs> her American plant is poison ivy because of racism. It makes us suffer needlessly for our skin. Uh, okay, uptown. This is <coughs> a piece from 1995, uh, I cast it myself in cement, two different colors to show that the young County Cullen who was famous in a way that he wanted, he wanted to be like John Keats, he wanted universal fame, he wanted very much for his obituary to say famous poet died. I looked up his mind obituaries and they all said famous Negro poet died. Um, but he was very interested in skin color and the abstraction of it and the reality of racial prejudice. So the poetry of his that's on his base reflects that. And this is in the lobby of the County Hollow Branch of the New York Public Library. And here's the portrait I did from life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I wrote her a fan letter and asked her post for me and she did and she now has a copy of this here in one of Columbia University. Oh, and that by way of just saying yes, I can not just the people who have been dead for 100 years. Um, uh, <coughs> statues on literary walk. Oh, literary walk. The function of the scroll is also chronological. to tell the history through quotations, <coughs> arranged in a poetic way so that you, you want to keep reading. And we'll begin in 1848 with all men and women are created equal. When Stanton essentially wrote for the first, world's first women's rights convention, all the way down.
down into the 19th Amendment, you may vote. Um, by way of 25 women who all have passionate, interesting, um, and easily condensed things to say about the struggle and how it progressed. So it is, in fact, a kind of literary work that comes from their writing and speech making. Uh, placement. Um, uh, Halleck is five feet across, single figure. This is nine feet in diameter, the pedestal, and then the base is 11 feet. Even though she is in scale and Halleck, the object is much larger, and the extension comes out another about six feet to the edge. So it speaks to the corner of the site, but it is also essentially the <coughs> center between the side path and the very large elm tree that is there. And as you're walking down the wall, you will experience it across from Halleck, even though it is really only tangent to this side of this pedestal. Any closer to the tree I felt at the site would be to crowd the sculpture because the high part of the sculpture is here. If the tree is right here as opposed to here, it would have as much room to breathe. This is the site. You see the tree. There's no tree here. There's also no tree opposite this one. It's missing. South of Halleck, there's no tree. And on the opposite corner, one tree up is missing as well. So there are holes in this arrangement. The impression is of a kind of organic symmetry. The corner, you see a replacement tree back there. Um, this is looking from the side path, path south towards the other poets who are well away down there. Here's Halleck. You can see it makes very much a narrow vertical impression as an object. And here's the site. From the back path, the cross, the east. And you will be able to see the back of the monument from a distance as you go around the back towards the statue of the Indian hunter, John Quincy Adams Ward. This is from a path way to the south. Here's Bobby Burns looking up towards the corner. And there are often kiosks, artists, etc., set up there. Um, do we have a patina sample? Yes. Uh, <coughs> this is paint. So this is bronze. Uh, I would call this a dark brown patina. Um, that's kind of what I'm thinking of in line with the other statues. And a gray marble from Vermont, uh, which is not depicted here. This is uh, the Lucy Stone statue after some years. So you see variations. There's a little bit of a, a brighter brown here, darker. Um, I like the way this has aged. Uh, this is a pretty good representation of what's going on with the trees. This tree is not as big. This tree is humongous and it comes way over, it grows over this side because there's been no tree here. Um, okay. Seven foot seated figure, nine foot standing figure. The top of the plinth is about here. The top of the, has, uh, the, top of the bronze plinth, actually, what they're standing on. Is. And these are just close-up shots of this maquette in an earlier stage. But you see the back view. And again, this is preliminary. I'm <coughs> making these figures at three feet high and then making them again full size, which is the usual process for going from a tiny thing to a line of sculpture. To work out every detail so you're not shifting enormous amounts of clay in a full size model. Here's a miracle of Photoshop. 
Have a sculpture in the park. Have uh, letters that are filled in with the dark patina. It will be 
um, legible, I would say, for 10 or 12 feet. So you will see that there's writing on it and you'll come up. Because people are going by, if you're going to stop and read it, you'll come up. And, uh, I, I'm just, I, I wanted to just yeah, support that the idea of, of, of like a project like this being worked. I think it's yes. exactly what we need. But I also want to sort of mention that there is this. New York being this monumental city as well, and the women trying to be monumental or presented as monumental. We don't, it's not just um, our history with monuments, but we also have some of the most amazing museums here. One that's a modern museum is the many contemporary art museums. So I think that to sort, to sort of get cue from not just sort of the metropolitan relic or a natural history museum sort of antiquated or like something is in the dark room, everything's in the middle corner here, you know, sort of, there's, this is, today is 2018, and there's so much that has happened since this day, and so much more that will happen, and I think that it's an opportunity that we should consider having something not so, that looks like it was made 100 years ago. Well, hopefully, okay, a few things. Hopefully, the sense of humor and uh, uh, defiance involved in making the pedestal round and having the skull come off the pedestal, these are not things that 19th century sculpture would do, will indicate that I'm a contemporary sculptor, which I am. I, I look at contemporary art, I read theory, I'm not somebody <coughs> off the retro standards. Um, this is for Central Park, which is a historical artifact. I mean, it's alive, people use it, it's full of contemporary um, exercise and recreation, but the design is 19th century and demands a, a respect. And these women were of that era, so it's all, it's part of all of the piece, and history is getting lost. So what I want to do, there will be more dynamics in the figures, that's why I'm saying my process is first to render them at three feet, and then to again have models come in and work at six feet I'm working from. Actresses, dancers who can express with their bodies a lot of energy. So these will not be static figures. And the relationship between them is, is incredibly important to how they look. I can't, I can't do that at size. Um, I'm not a miniaturist. Uh, but I appreciate the historical objects. I think that that's really interesting. But I try to work in a style that is that recognizes our history. I wanted to follow up on one point. Um, the, the concept in, of the, uh, the history on the scroll and leading to the, the uh, ballot box is wonderful and a way of in, inclusiveness while you were focused up for something to figures with the government. I just wondered uh, also uh, to make one point, but in terms of what you mentioned earlier about um, that the, the, the person walking by, the view or whatever, we can see it all from behind and in front, which is quite wonderful also. The other statues perhaps we saw in that one way. So then I did, I, I don't know, but I have a, some concern about uh, the clarity and legibility of the names and the history of the scroll and wondered, it, in a way it's conventional, but maybe not in a bad way, if, if the history and the names and the invocation of all those who contributed could, in fact, in some fashion, be incorporated on the pedestal or in some way so that it, it does become incredible, and then we can you can see all around and read the names. But I'm not saying to do it that way, but I think it might perhaps be something uh, to consider from the point of view of legibility, uh, inclusion, clarity, and relating uh, to the two figures. There will be other inscriptions. There will be a dedication on the back. Which will be what? Uh, this pen? Well, usually it's, everyone knows there's some kind of uh, hats off to the group 
donated it and when it was presented and dedicated, so it's more a uh, factual kind of description of it. There's, Robbie Burns has several lines of text. Yeah, I, 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 and then there we, are more. We tested it for Yeah, we tested it for legibility, but hang on. Um, as yet, we don't have quotations from these women, and we're considering whether there should be blocks of text on the sides. But that's, again, a legibility question and a design question. So you are you are considering um, treating the base in, in some way yes. is, is that what you, that you are in the yes. process of considering. But I, I believe that inscriptions in the bronze can be made the most legible. There are ways to highlight the letters and the edges of them slightly upturned so that they cast a deeper shadow. There are a lot of technical ways to make that very legible. And we did print an object like the scroll, take it to the park, and even with my progressive lenses, I could <laughs> read it from right. So, so in terms of reading, yeah, I appreciate what you said. In terms of reading it, I'm even looking at the figures there. Um, the, the kids standing there, the one, the two, the girl, and the boy, say, am I correct? I mean, might not be able to read it. In order to read, the scroll, do you have to stay over there and be, I mean, on the right, is that in order to be able to read it, or? Yeah, I'm just thinking of how we can maximize it. the other statues just basically. Yes, this is I different, so exactly. I, and that's wonderful that it is. I'm just asking how we I can want experience it. I want people to move. Um, the Marian Anderson figure is designed so that you are really sucked into going around and seeing the back of her, which I spent a great deal of time on. And here, too, um, the law books under the chair, the Declaration of Sentiments, the documents in the bag, all of these are part of the story and will be described in the history online that goes with this. The virtual scroll online will now be a website. Um, but I want people to move, so there is no way to to make this a beautiful, exciting object and have it become like a placard. So I want people to actually move past and maybe even back to be able to read it. Because it will take you five minutes to read it. And it's better for your health than you want. So it's well, compared to going around. So I'm super excited about the idea of this first monument and that you're honoring um, Susan B. Anthony and Casey. I mean, I, I mean, it's interesting in the other monuments, it's usually a singular male, and the male looks out and returns a gaze to or a heaven or, yes. or heaven, but, but returns the gaze. So I was kind of curious about why there's this, um, you know, because we're presented with one version. There was a question about are there other versions with the preliminary, and there's this very intimate conversation going on, and there are, um, we're told that there's the uh, intention um, to portray this uh, philosopher, writer and philosopher in full of energy of her radical philosophy, mm -hmm. which I'm super excited about. Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of outward radical philosophy. And I just am not reading it here, so that's one point. Second point has to do with the base. And I know that we're in a historical uh, uh, series of, of monuments here as reference point, but in your Boston Memorial, um, You've worked really kind of very creatively with a base. I know it's a different situation to create the base to be more an integral part of the sculpture rather than a kind of historical artifact. Because even though this is round, I don't. I think it still reads as the simple base. And it seems like there's an opportunity that perhaps even um, some of the texts or different scale could be incorporated in that base um, in a more innovative and 21st century mode, since we have. Um, methods and means available to us using these materials that are very different than what were available before. And I think also because of the location of the fence, even though you, you, want, you want us to move around, which I really appreciate that you see all sides of it, um, it seems that there are kind of two views, <laughs> you know, almost, and that um, it's struggling actually to, one, one is not, a, a viewer would be struggling to read that text. Um, that would probably work better if you were in the round. So I would just ask if you could consider 
other ways in which the text which seems very important because you don't want there to be just a singular voice here. Right? That's why there's not just a singular person, I understand. So if there's a way you can bring more voices in in a, in a more full way, perhaps, through text that is more readable at different scales, maybe. But not, you know, well, just I would love to get rid of the fence. Um, part of the function of the ballot box is to lift this up so that you don't have to be standing right by the fence to read it. You can be back here and still see it above the fence, um, which the photo doesn't convey because it's looking from your approach as you're strolling down the hall. Um, the, as far as addressing the viewer, uh, I don't think any of those statues were true in the Guineas. I think they're all looking out or they're looking up. Um, and they're elevated, so they're looking, they're not looking down at you saying, come read my poetry. They're really not. Um, the point here is that this kind of activism is based on relationships. It's not abstract. It's, it needs energy from another person or people. And this is the gaze. What comes forward to us, this is what looks at you. It's going to say vote on the front. <coughs> yeah, I think what we're struggling with here, that it's almost a literal translation of a photograph that is, and we wanted to know if you were married to the idea of this specific composition of one person see the other person looking towards the seated person. And I think for, for me, I'm not sure if anyone else agrees that, I feel like the scroll is the most dynamic part, even though the intent or the description of what you want is to portray or to give us a sense of energy, dynamism, future, powerful women. Um, um, also a sense of contemplation, right. of privacy, of the battery being charged in the home, and then it's fired out into the world. I mean, this was, I, 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 this was not a, a speaking platform. Those suffragists were 20th century. Right. If we're going to honor the 19th century ones, we really have to go back to that time when women were not speaking in public, they were not going out in public, they couldn't own property, they couldn't sign up uh, contracts, they were not entitled to keep their own wages. If they left their husband, he took the children by law. They had no legal standing. And they, their costumes only showed their faces and hands, so they had very little expression except from writing. And I, I kind of want to convey, nevertheless, the dynamism and energy that they collectively produce. So I'm not trying to make a 21st century monument. I'm trying to make something that comes forward to the 21st century. And there are many things in contemporary monuments that I find inelegant when contemporary sandblasting of images onto polished stone, for instance, in the Korean Veterans Memorial in Washington. Personally, I don't think that works at all. There are bronze statues, they're sandblasting. You get all the information, but it's not beautiful, it's not sculptural, it looks cheap and contemporary and easy because it's done by machine. So I'm trying to avoid that and use hands-on historical techniques that they would have been familiar with and bring it forward. Like sitting here, there's an expression sometimes that less is more. And I'm concerned about the number of different things which to me are not about, they may be about the people, but they're not the people. And by having them as part of your composition, I think it makes it harder to read the power of the women themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think I, if I were doing my bed sculpture, I think I would eliminate most everything that you have there to have to win. Because I would like to see the women and, and their strength and their character. And I'm not sure I would looking at these things, unless you know all the story, you know, they're, they're elements, they're details, but they're not core. They're not core about, about the women themselves. So well, the monuments are there for centuries, and people, even in a single lifetime, you will see it many times. And it's nice to have things to discover, like Alice in Wonderland has lizards underneath, and, and things that, that are not even in the book that you discover as you see it again and again. Saying the Morse has attributes, um, a 
other statues in Central Park have attributes. As I proceed to the larger scale, I'm going to emphasize their faces also because of the tree shadow, the dark patina. I'm going to emphasize their character, their gestures, and their faces. And everything else will be secondary, except the lettering on the scroll, which will be legible. So I'm hoping that as a sculptor, I can convince you that these things are just there in the background to be discovered in five years when you're giving an ice cream on the Pacific Park Mall. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, Karen? So I think just to reiterate that as a commission, we are hugely supportive of this. We thank everyone in the room who has contributed to making this possible. Um, it would seem, listening to my fellow commissioners, that um, that there's a. We just want to be sure that your own words um, are conveyed in terms of the the energy and the passion. Recognizing that all of this was kind of <clears throat> had to happen in the closet, um, and that uh, that this the intimacy and sort of the kitchen table quality of this movement. Um, but that's not lost in, in their, um, I think, facial expression, as you said, the, the manner in which they relate to each other. Um, so, uh, and, I, I, and I've heard several suggestions and, um, for you to consider as to whether the uh, appreciating what you said about the piece wanting to be of its time and forward. Um, as to whether the base is an opportunity to uh, express that in some way or another, whether it is through the information that's conveyed on it, the, the manner in which it's conveyed, I, by the way, agree with you on the Korean War, um, uh, or, or uh, you know, even the, the, the shape of it. But I, I, I respect your uh, sense of history with regard to the park uh, and with regard to um, how the other um, statues relate to the park. Um, and so I think your instinct about how this piece should comport itself is, is, um, is valuable. And, um, I guess we look forward to seeing it at three feet. Thank you. If I might say one more thing. I would love to have been or to be commissioned to do a monument to the marches, the suffragette parades, in the middle of Times Square, down off the pedestal, electronic placards, um, every contemporary element that you can put in it because it would need that in that environment. But this is literary wall, so it's a contemplative space. It's about what effect words will have, the spiritual connection of writers to their muse or their anger. In this case, um, I did make a nod to the 20th century suffragist with the back of her chair, which is this prison gate emblem of the suffragists who were prisoners in the mother um, But in this beautiful <coughs> artifact that is central. Park, I thought this was as contemporary an object as I could propose. Thank you. The public meeting is now commencing with the consent agenda. We have <coughs> items number 26791, 26839. Mm -hmm. the conditions of approval as recommended by the various committees and the recusals. Uh, staff has noted Commissioner Shepard's recusal from Item 26792 and Commissioner Norman Bell's refusal from item 26803. Are there any other refusals not noted? Um, no let the record show there are no other refusals. And for the record, there are no members of the public.